So the 17th century is referred to as the scientific revolution, or at least it marks the start of it. There's advances in astrology, like for instance, Galileo Galileo states that the Earth revolves around the sun. There's mathematical advances, thank you, Kepler. And Isaac Newton plays around with gravity during this time. So there's a lot of good, but there's also, a, unfortunately, a lot of bad. And that's like the Thirty Year War, which occurs during this time. And it's a war between Catholics and Protestants. And Britain colonizes America at this time. It's the first colonies. And unfortunately, they also bring over the first slaves to the British colonies. And there's also a plague that occurs, killing 75,000 people in London. So, like any moment in history, there's a lot of good and a lot of bad happening. And that was just the very tip of the iceberg, not even, um, of what's happening during this time. But for art, there's a movement that comes out of this period, and that's referred to the Baroque period. Now, the Baroque movement, the word comes from, yet again, an Italian word used by jewelers for irregular pearls, which, believe it or not, it's very fitting for the artwork that comes out of this time period, rough and beautiful all at the same time. And it's very much so like the 17th century. So just to start off with, you know, my favorite thing to do, a, a, a comparison, and we're going to compare the Davids. Now, we're going to look at Donatello's David, Michelangelo's David, and the new artist that we're going to look at, his name is Bernini, so Bernini's David. And what I did here is I actually have them set up in sort of the story that's being told. So the first thing to notice is that they're all in different moments of the story. Michelangelo's is the beginning. Bernini's is the middle, and Donatello's is the end. And it's very fitting for what happens during each artist's sort of time period. If we look at Donatello's, his is after the action. So he's already slain Goliath, which was made after Florence's victory over Milan. Michelangelo's David is before the battle. He's ready to fight. And at the time, Florence had adopted David as their symbol, saying to everyone that they are there to defend their city. So again, it's very appropriate that he's standing there ready to fight. And now, a little bit of backstory of Bernini before I get into his sort of period. Bernini was born in Naples, Italy to a father who was a manneristic artist. And at the age of eight, he was considered a prodigy. And even though he was born in Naples, he was basically raised in Rome. So he's looking at all of the classical artists that came before him in Rome. So anyway, back to their Davids. If we, again, look at Bernini's David, and if you recall that during the 1600s, 17th century, the Thirty Year War is going on. There's a lot of wars actually happening. There's this power struggle that's occurring. It's very appropriate that Bernini's David is in mid-action. Now, Donatello's and Michelangelo's begins with that contraposto, or has that pose from the Greek art. But Bernini's, his has that figure serpentinata, which is from manneristic art. And if you recall from what I just said, his father was a manneristic artist. So again, this makes a lot of sense. Anatomically wise, all three are very accurate, but Bernini's ancient Greek influence is less towards the sort of Kyoto boys, if you remember them, and it's more towards the Hellenistic period. So it has this humanistic aspect, and not so much an idealized realism. And if we focus in on the faces between Bernini's and Michelangelo's, we actually can see sort of this 
comparison of intense emotion or expression. Now, the furrowed brow from Michelangelo's is carried over into Bernini's, but Bernini pushes it further by the tightened mouth, the clutched jaw, and the expressions sort of have a different reaction to the audience. And I'll get into the audience further later. Now, the biggest difference between Donatello's and Michelangelo's David in comparison to Bernini's is, again, bringing in the audience, it's how it engages the viewer. So Donatello's and Michelangelo's and all their beauty and perfection are stagnant and they're separate from the viewer. We contemplate their perfection. We aren't engaged with their perfection. For Bernini's, the audience is engaged with the sculpture, as if Goliath is standing behind us, and David is about to swing any second over our heads with the slingshot in his hand. And Bernini brings the viewer's mind and body into the works themselves to further engage his audience. We're not standing there looking at the body. Our body is reacting almost in fear of what could be behind us, that Bernini would be in such a pose, or Bernini's David would be in such a pose. So next we have Caravaggio. Now, he's probably most known for his sort of crazy background, and I'll kind of cover that a little bit, but He's also known for his chiaroscuro, scudo. And what this word means is basically just dramatic lighting created to increase contrast within painting. Now, Caravaggio had a background in portraiture and still lives. Those are the two major apprenticeships that he does while in Rome, or at least, you know, he does a lot of apprenticeships, but those are the two most influential within his works. When we look at his work, it will show, and he actually said that painting a still life took just as much skill as painting the body. To sort of defend his works, since still lives weren't seen very in high regards at the time, which is probably why, again, he also brings models into his paintings. Now, Caravaggio changes a lot of things up when it comes to painting, and it kind of has some influence into that wild past that I was briefly mentioned earlier. There are many records of him getting called into court. He was thrown in jail a lot. Eventually, probably the most scandalous thing is that he actually gets accused of, or commits murder, and inevitably is on the run for the rest of his life. Now, we know that he used people off of the streets for his models, and oftentimes were the, those were the people that kind of came from the tavern um, where he roughed house at or fooled around. And we know this because he couldn't afford models. And speaking of which, one of his models that he actually uses is himself in a painting called Bacchus. This is his less known Bacchus. And he uses himself as the model. And now Bacchus is the god of wine and youthfulness. But Caravaggio depicts him sick and off-putting. Even the grapes in his hand are rotted. So Bacchus, Bacchus has green, greenish skin. And it's mostly believed it's depicting jaundice. The eyes indicate issues with the liver, and the gray chapped lips could all be signs of actually malaria, which Caravaggio could have been suffering from when he created this painting. We know that he was doing hospital visits during this time, so we know he was suffering from something. Even the nails are encrusted with dirt, and sort of the bags beneath the eyes, all while he's offering these rotted, gross grapes to the viewer. Now, his more known Bacchus painting is most likely a model that's a farmer. And this is based off of the tan lines. And even the dirt 
once again beneath the fingernails. Now, his paintings take on a hyper-realism, depicting every aspect of his model. And like Bernini's sculptures, his paintings are just more mental, aren't just mental stimulus, but also brings in the body. And this is suggested with the wine, which is stretched out for the viewer to take, inviting the viewer into the painting plane. So many of his paintings inspire other artists that actually went to Rome and saw his works. And here are just some of his more renowned works. And again, we see that chiaroscuro, and we actually we see it developing too. And he brings the viewer into the plane. He's bringing the body into the plane in subtle suggestions in his composition. And one of the artists that's actually going to be inspired by him is an incredible female artist that we're going to look at. And she's definitely worth mentioning, Artemisia. And she used chiaroscuro. Now, she was able to learn because her father was also a painter. Her father was actually friends with Caravaggio. So it sort of makes sense that she would be inspired by his works and sort of make similar works. Now, in her paintings, she also drew inspiration from reality, much like Caravaggio. And I'll actually, I'll compare the two later on. But in her painting, Judith beheading Helifernus, she most likely was observing the public beheadings that occurred at the time. So that's where this sort of hyper-realism, again, with Caravaggio, and here's the comparison between the two, um, sort of comes into play. Now, Caravaggio's is actually a little bit stiffer than Artemisia. Artemisia really uh, perfects sort of the drama and intensity of the moment. And Caravaggio sort of depicts the women a little bit more afraid in a way. They're sort of standing off from the brutality and in fact the maidservants much older and not even doing anything at all. Whereas in Artemisia's, they're both engaged. There's this tension between the bodies and the struggle. There's the fists up against the heads and the pressure that you can feel and the blood of course going everywhere. The sleeves are rolled up, you know, they are fully engaged in the action and their faces, even though Artemisia's are very cold, you know, it, it's, they're getting the job done and that's kind of the face that they're making, like, oh, okay, gotta get the job done. Um, so she's kind of depicting this in a very brutal way. Now, this is not her only version of this. She actually, she did one beforehand. So the one on the left is actually earlier than the one on the right. And the reason why she does these changes is not just within the fabrics, but there's also some anatomical changes that she makes and it's just these adjusts that kind of enhance it and bring it more into this hyper-realism. And again, she was probably studying the headings to get this just right. And um, one of the things that she adds is actually the blood spewing from the neck. Uh, that's not in the first version. And again, that's probably from her beheadings. And also the proportions of the head itself change very slightly. It's nothing that really would jump out of you right away, but there's just these little tiny anatomical changes again that it just enhance the painting that much. Now, it's there to enhance the realistic depiction of a brutal scene. Now, this is kind of a common theme of sort of her works and what she does is it's a lot of her works tend to be a little bit more um, sort of intense in that way and uh, it, it's like a beautiful tragedy that's unveiling before your eyes you don't want to see it but it's so beautifully done that you can't help but look at it and all the while there's actually another artist of the time that we're going to look at, Rembrandt, and he takes on a completely different approach. So Rembrandt, he's probably most known for portraits, and one of his otter portraitures 
is actually the anatomy lesson of Dr. Nicholas Cope. And a little fun fact about the sections of the time, there were actually, there were public, so we're now in Northern Europe, and there were a public event in Northern Europe, and they would dissect criminals. So they were only allowed to dissect criminals at this time. And there were portraits done during these dissections. Now, the entire portrait is actually an illusion. So this didn't happen during the public dissection. In fact, the men within the portrait probably paid a lot of money to be a part of it. And just some cues that indicate that it's an illusion, which is completely unlike Caravaggio's and Agamesia's, who portrayed the reality, Rembrandt created a portrait of the Griffin, two of which were added on later, and inaccurate attachments within the exposed arm. But it's interesting because the exposed arm happens before the stomach. So the stomach has not yet been opened, which would have happened first to expose you know, the organs that would have kind of rotted away quicker. And this exposed inaccurate arm is being held by the actual doctor himself, which also wouldn't happen. He would have had an assistant. And it's sort of hinted at this, the fact that there's no scalpel to be seen, which would have, again, been held by the assistant. So the anatomical inaccurate arm is more likely a gesture for the surgeon's arm being his tool, much like an artist's arm is their tool. So he's sort of making a connection between surgeons and artists. And although the arm isn't anatomically correct, you know, he, he does have a lot of references to the body and the scientific revolution of the time. We see this not only in the arm, but also in the body itself and the way that it's posed. Now, there was an earlier piece of um, Christ dead during the Renaissance, and I didn't show you guys it because it was a foreshortened piece, and I showed you a different foreshortened piece. Now, the Christ foreshortened is brought into this painting, and the pose looks just like it. And what he's trying to say there is that science is taking the place of religion of the time. So what's happening right now is that there's being a major shift. And he's sort of declaring it within this painting, that shift. And we're also seeing, you know, this guy is overlooking the body and he's casting a shadow over the face. And that actually represents the shadow of death that's kind of going to get us all in the end. So we, again, we have this sort of scientific revolution, the shadow of death coming for us, you know, the doctors and the artists being the same. And then all the way at the end of the feet is this book, and it's opened, and it has writing in it. And it's actually referring to the Renaissance. And during the time, there's basically the most revolutionary contribution to the study of anatomy um, happens because of this book. And... It's Vesalius de Humani Corpus Fabrica, if you, you've ever heard of the um, writer on the book. So Vesalius, he produces this book of anatomy and his theories on anatomy and his studies. And they put it, he put it in the painting, Rembrandt put it in the painting to kind of say that um, this is, you know, this is the past coming into the future. And again, that's just the title. So before the scientific revolution, Vesalius, he, you know, I mentioned his book. He created diagrams of the human body illustrating his books that went over in his theories of anatomy and physiology. Now, these studies aren't considered art, even though they're beautiful illustrations. And during the scientific revolution, there's actually other scientists that produce beautiful sketches along with their theories. And they're just, they're worth at least sort of mentioning, and it's William Harvey and Hieronymus Fabricus. And they're not considered artists, but a lot of what they created is valued within the bio-art world. Now, bio art doesn't come around until much later, <laughs> um, much, much later in the time frame, but 
it's just sort of important to demonstrate that, you know, they're illustrations, even though it's, it's sort of diagrams, it's still considered an illustration, it's still considered a part of the art realm, and it's depicting, you know, these advances and these anatomical, you know, what's really profound at the moment, anatomical um, demonstrations for everyone to read and sort of look at, but it's completely artistic in, in every single stroke of the pen that it took to create these diagrams.